Hey guys, it's Vivi Miniatures Warhammer Tactics Series and today we'll talk about the deployment. Anyone who had been in 40k for quite a while had probably heard the phrase that the games are won and lost in the deployment phase. And even though it's not exactly true each time you play, but it's definitely very important to know how to deploy and when and where to put your units. So today I'll try to convey the general idea of how the deployment phase should go if you are looking to maximize your potential during the game. So without further ado, let's dive right in. Deployment is an art in and of itself and will take years probably to master, especially if you are constantly switching armies, because a very important part of the deployment is knowing exactly what your force is supposed to do on the tabletop. But there are some general ideas that I believe would help you to achieve more during the games. First of all, I think that the deployment should be treated as a pseudo pre-game move. What I mean by that, if, for example, I were to tell you to play hide and seek with me and I say that you have 40 seconds to find a place to hide, where would you want to stand? Near the door where you can exit the room and go to another part of the house or right in the middle of the room where all the exits are far away? That's what I mean by pseudo pregame move. So when you know which deployment zone will be yours after you have rolled off and either your opponent selected the deployment zone or you, uh, it doesn't matter, you would have some deployment zone. After that, you will be able to determine based on how well you know your army and how well you know the particular unit, what's the, what place would give it the most tactical advantage, at least at the start of the game. So the second point I wanted to make is that you should have at least a basic idea of what a particular unit is meant to do during the game. And that comes down to the level of your experience and how well you know your army and your units in particular. But in general, when you are building your roster, you probably must have thought that, if, for example, if you have this unit of cyber wolves, they will probably be trading for objectives or holding the home objective. Nothing really special for them, but you should have that idea in mind. And that idea should preferably be realistic. So if you would imagine something crazy that is probably not going to happen to your unit, for example, rolling like a six on advance and 12 on the charge, that should not really happen realistically from the standpoint of statistics. So imagine what would probably happen and try to figure out the place to put the unit in this case and if you find it hard for you to predict what the main goal of the unit is now uh, it's okay because it comes with experience and the more you play the finer your predictions will become just try to think about that stuff and it will come to you sooner or later third point before the game please please just look at the board and take a moment to study and take in the layout of terrain and your deployment zones even before you roll off and figure out who's defender and who's attacker so before you know which deployment zone is going to be yours just imagine both of those deployment zones because you probably know the mission already at this point if you know your table if we're talking about the tournament or if you're playing with a friend you probably already have rolled for a mission or selected it so just look at the table and imagine where the disposition of the units is probably going to be what are the terrain pieces that will make the biggest impact on the game and are the biggest the uh, the ones that have the more potential to cause harm for, to you to your plans or be beneficial instead and the next logical step would be trying to at least partially imagine how your first turn will look and how your first turn will look if your opponent is going first instead and think about what you are going to do where will you move your models what will you shoot and why would you do that and if you're thinking now that it's impossible and it's too hard there are too many combinations of units moving and you don't know where your opponent is going to deploy because it's before the game so they have not put a single unit on the table just stay calm because that's just your brain trying to be lazy because our brains are wired to conserve energy and they don't want to work you must be patient and try to think through the steps that you would take or your opponent would take just imagine yourself in their place and try to figure out if they have a tank where would they put this tank 
they there are probably not so many combinations and if you now have a basic idea of where the tank goes maybe you can figure out where you should put your guns that would probably want to shoot that at this tank and so on and so forth if you find it too hard to try to incorporate your opponent into this equation just start with your own army how is it supposed to work what are your units are supposed to be doing are they supposed to be charging are they supposed to be shooting or doing psychic stuff whatever your units have some role in your roster figure out this role and find a place where they could start doing what they're supposed to be doing as fast as possible while not being open for the shooting phase of your opponent in this case if you think if you believe at this point in your training that you are not ready to start incorporating the whole army of your opponent into the equation of your deployment just start with a simple thing try to figure out how fast are the units of your opponent and where and what guns do they have where they can shoot so if you incorporate only the range of their guns the move characteristic of the things that carry those guns so that's the effective range uh their move plus the range or the move plus advance plus the range if they can advance and shoot which is not that often for the heavy guns and the main thing is if you know how far your opponent can move and charge in the first turn just think about only that nothing else try to think of the ideas of the uses for your units that you have had when you're building your roster that's the approach that i would take if i were more of a beginner the advanced beginner let's just say the aforementioned steps would probably only take you like two or three minutes maybe five minutes maximum of your play time and it's not bad to spend the time because it would boost your overall performance considerably and don't try to think about everything all at once because that's how you get into analysis paralysis that i've mentioned in my top 10 tips for noobs in 40k video when your brain just has too much going on inside it it usually just stops uh, thinking and freezes and that's how you lose a lot of energy and make some very very dumb mistakes that you probably wouldn't make if you weren't so burnt out so gauge carefully how much of your energy can you spend before the game not to be too exhausted and the best thing that you can do for yourself is stay calm when you are thinking don't worry about the outcome because at the end of the day you are learning and even if you make a mistake it does not necessarily mean that you will lose the game now let's talk about a very interesting topic it's deployment by unit types the thing is that each army in 40k probably has uh, units that belong to each of these categories or most of them and if you can determine which category the unit in particular one in your roster belongs to it will probably be easier for you to know what you should do uh, with this unit at which step in the deployment meaning what you are deploying first what you are deploying after that part and what you are deploying last just a small disclaimer not everything is set in stone here and some units belong to multiple categories at once and it's probably even good when you can uh, use one unit for all four categories or all three categories it means that this unit is very universal and has a lot of potential and a lot of uses for you in the games so what do we have here first type that i have in almost all of my armies it's what i call cannon fodder uh, these aren't units that I'm necessarily throwing away or neglecting. You should not neglect anything in the army because at the end of the day you don't have a lot of points to waste. These are just units that you deploy first before all the other stuff in your army. It's when you have the least information on your opponent's plan. Again, even if you aren't that great at this moment in analyzing and predicting what your opponent is going to do because it's relatively hard to do and it takes time to get used to this way of thinking before the game and it probably requires you to know at least something about the force that you are facing but anyways when the your opponent starts putting the units in place on the table you can look at that and take at least a wild guess at where the next 
one is going to be. So don't keep your eyes only on your deployment zone. Try to at least partially imagine or look with one eye at what your opponent is doing over there in their deployment zone. So back to cannon fodder. It's what you put first on the table before you know at least something about the opponent's plans based on what they have actually put on the table. And usually it's the stuff that you don't really care about or these are the units that have some fixed place on the board like your troops or your objective holders that will be standing in that particular spot in your deployment zone all game and you don't really want to move them uh, from there anyway. So you are better off just putting them there at the start of the deployment before all other units that you would maybe want to think more about and use the time that your opponent spends on putting their units on the table to think more about what you want to do with your next category. These can also be some fast support characters that aren't required to be near your main units in your army right from the get-go. They can get to the uh, required unit a bit later in the game, maybe in your first movement phase. Just don't forget to provide lookout sir for them because you don't want to lose your character even the support ones in your first turn. Next category is slow and vulnerable. And take the vulnerable part with a grain of salt because I don't mean that this unit must be easy to kill. It may be extremely hard to kill, like a Terminator blob. I just mean that this unit is very important to you, so you want to do as much for it as possible to preserve it and save it from the damage that is going to eventually come from your opponent's side of the board. That's why you are deploying these guys second, because you have not probably taken up a lot of space with your cannon fodder. These units are usually small in size and you have a lot of real estate in your deployment zone with obscuring terrain, with cover, light cover, I mean with dense cover, forest and etc. A lot of places where you can put the important units to maximize their chances to survive the first turn whatever comes their way plus you're using up your most luxurious your most expensive real estate in your deployment zone these are the zones the places where your units can be as close as possible to the action of the game whilst being covered obscured or at least uh, partially covered by a light cover and dense cover and again we've established that you should know how far your opponent's units can charge realistically if they would want to and don't put your expensive important quote-unquote vulnerable stuff too far forward if you can avoid it and if the actual stuff that can uh, come at them is dangerous to them. So if you're playing against Drukari and they have like a unit of three reaver jet bikers, don't be afraid that they will charge you if you are trying to figure out the place for your terminators because those bikers will do nothing to your terminators. Whereas if you are trying to find a place for your tank, maybe you should do it more carefully because they'll jet, jet, those jet bikers, even though they will probably do nothing to the tank itself, they will tie it up and prevent it from shooting in your next shooting phase and your main characters those that support your main damage dealers in your army they should go near the slow and vulnerable part as well especially if there are some characters that do stuff in the command phase like the chaplain always pre-measure and don't make a rookie's mistake of putting your chaplain too far behind where he's in range of some units but not those that should get the benefit of the litanies for example the third category are the fast units, the fast stuff as I've called it here. These are units that are fast enough that you don't really mind putting them a bit further inside your deployment zone unless you have a specific plan in mind. Uh, for example, those uh, already mentioned three river jet bikers. If you are playing with the Drukari army and you have those three bikes, Perhaps you don't want to uh, use the move characteristic by just putting them further into the deployment zone where there is probably a lot of real estate where you can hide behind. Uh, maybe you want to put them as far forward because your opponent has those tanks in his force that you could probably try to charge in your first turn if you are lucky enough and can roll high on your charge. And if your opponent makes the mistake of putting their tanks uh, too far forward. That's why these units go third, because you have already taken up 
pretty much most of your valuable space in the deployment zone by your slow and vulnerable and cannon fodder units and you have the fast stuff which can either be used just by placing them further inside the deployment zone and using their move characteristic to get out of there and actually be useful or wait until uh, some point in the game where they can be useful to you or you can move them forward because you have already some idea of where your opponent is going to deploy because already some of their units should be on the table at this point and maybe concoct a plan to make the best out of this fast stuff to make the life of your opponent harder and the fourth category are the pretty durable and distracting units uh, these can be interchanged with the third category and the second sometimes your third category will also be the, your fourth these are your tactical assets they go last because you honestly didn't have enough space to put them behind obscuring terrain sometimes or you can only put them very far behind so it will be hard for them to be active in the first or maybe even second turns unless you use them as a distraction unit and put them right in the open but in the open where if you go first they could be extremely useful for you and could possibly run advance to the cover in the no man's land especially if you have for example a big slow and vulnerable unit inside the ruin so it's visible and can be shot at but has the gets the benefits of light cover and you put your pretty durable distracting unit for example unit for five blade guard uh, that you can protect with transhuman unlike the terminators there that you couldn't protect with transhuman and you put them not inside the ruin but somewhere nearby where they could possibly advance to the side objective the objective on the side of the board which is important for you because you want to take the objective as fast as possible so that's probably the type of unit that you could use for this role of pretty durable and distracting and if for some reason if they get shot and they get wiped out it's not that big of a deal because you tried to use them as wisely as possible of course again this is just my interpretation and that's how i feel the units should be used and i recommend to think about the category that each unit belongs to while you are building your roster and when you have this kind of planning be before the games it will be much easier for you to at least start deploying units in the correct way when the actual games game happens by the way, let's talk about the typical terrain layout in the games or maybe tournaments if you are attending them. Most tables nowadays have a lot of big line of sight blocking ruins that can be used to hide units and provide light cover if you are inside them or touching the wall based on how you play in your club or the tournament decides plus those ruins are defensible for infantry units so you can either when you are charged you can select to overwatch on the five up or, or hitting on the five up or have plus one to hit in the upcoming fight phase these ruins they make a huge impact on the game because obviously when you can make some of your units untouchable by the shooting and psychic powers it's very important but those units can still be affected by charging them usually nowadays you'd have one or two of these ruins uh, big or small ones in each of the deployment zones and one to three of those in the no man's land now these tournaments have a lot of ruins on the tables and usually you'd have like five or six at least and all the other space uh, real estate will be taken up by different terrain types but sometimes you can encounter a very open table which will only have like three ruins a maximum and all other space will be taken up by forests and gantries and stuff like that forests by the way they are the next most popular category as well as the gantries so the mechanical terrain basically uh, they both provide dense cover but forests also are difficult ground so when you move through them you must subtract two from your move characteristic each time you move except for piling and consolidation so if you end up stuck on the forest in the charge phase you will also uh, subtract two from your charge roll mechanical terrain does not have that you don't need to subtract two from the your move characteristic when you move through the gantries these are great for ranged firepower because you can shoot through them whilst you are inside them and uh, do that with no penalty to hit where the opponent if you are going to be shot at where you are inside the forest while the unit is inside the forest they will have to subtract one from the hit rolls 
So when you're deploying, uh, take a look at where the forests are and don't put your slow units that don't have fly because fly ignores the, this rule. Don't put your slow units right in the center of the forest because if it's a big forest and your unit moves like five inches, like Terminators, for example, they will take forever to get out of that forest and you will just spend a couple of your turns trying to actually get somewhere with them. And that's why it does not really matter for your ranged firepower because you are not going anywhere and you want to stay in that forest and keep shooting. It's not often when you have good line of sight angles from your force, but sometimes it happens and you can use it to your advantage. Next relatively popular category are barricades and fuel pipes. Those are basically obstacles so uh, you can move through them but you must uh, pay the price of minus two to your move characteristic as well as with the forests. They give both light and heavy cover. Heavy cover is, for those who don't know, it's just just as light cover, but you can only get it if you are charged. So if you charge, you don't get it. And that's cover that you get in melee. So there is actually a type of cover that does something for you in melee, and that's the heavy cover. Just bear in mind that if you're playing against the melee heavy army, especially if you're playing against the melee heavy army, the barricade make it easier for your opponent to charge your units because they must end up touching the terrain feature and within two inches of the target unit to be able to make close combat attacks so much easier especially if you are trying to charge from dip strike it's very important to Remember, because your opponent probably needs to roll an 8 instead of a 9. And the last category are creators. They're pretty easy to understand. Basically, a difficult ground terrain feature that also gives light cover. So if you're inside a crater, it's hard for you to move, but you are also slightly protected. Get a plus one to your safe. And now let's look at the close to real world example. So uh, mission recover the relics from your current Nephilim book and uh, it's a typical Italian flag deployment. So you have 18 inches on each side divided by the 24 inch no man's land. We have four big line of sight blocking ruins. So those are indicated by green squares. The blue square is the forest. In this case the craters are indicated by the black circles those are that are between the green squares and the small ruins or something like containers are the yellow stuff in the corners and the deployment zones the centers of the deployment zones and to make it easier for our brains at this moment i will not be trying to interpret what the next move of your opponent would be because in a lot of cases it does not really matter because you you should probably deploy like that anyways whatever your opponent does if they have redeployment options or not that's the best way to deploy in all the cases for your units and most of them at least you can imagine that you're playing against gin stealer cults and you don't know where the heck they will end up at the end so just deploy as if there is nothing on the table yet and we are playing with black templars so we have three characters some vehicles a lot of infantry and um, yeah probably that's it so what are we going to start with i see that we have uh, no troops here so nothing probably in the chef category except for a unit of eliminators as they are a pretty survivable unit and are pretty much expendable we are going to put them right near the central objective in our deployment zone and behind this small yellow ruin that's the place where those eliminators will probably end up staying all game and it's Pretty, it's a pretty great place because they get the benefits of cover and also are holding the objective for you. You may keep them behind the ruin for now because uh, they don't need to hold the objective at the start of your turn, at the start of your command phase. They only need to get there uh, up in your movement phase to hold it in your second turn to get those primaries for you. What is next? Well, next, as we don't have any other chaff or expendable stuff yet, or any troops, uh, we want to start putting the units that will take up as much of our real estate and uh, those that should be closer to your opponent while still being obscured. And that's where we should probably start deploying our Redemptor Dreadnoughts uh, one by one because we want them to occupy the space behind, just behind the terrain feature to be hidden from the enemy firepower but still pretty close to the center of the board to be able to move out in your first turn and at least try to shoot something. 
As you can see, I have three redemptors on one side and one redemptor on the other. And it means that we will need to balance out the flanks. We'll need to put something substantial on the part on the side where there is only one redemptor dreadnought. As you can see, I've moved the redemptor to the other side of the ruin to make it easier for him to walk out and start shooting right from the center of the board where it would probably have more targets to choose from. And I've put the eradicators behind the same ruin to make sure that after they move Move their five inches they will be able to target at least something and they probably won't suffer the penalty of minus one to hit for the forest because they will most likely be shooting right at uh, the stuff that is uh, on the other side of the board in your opponent's deployment zone so where the green square is on in the red deployment zone if they will have any targets for that matter because it's not guaranteed their biggest concern at this point should be not making sure that they shoot in the first turn but making sure that they cannot be shot in the first turn so protecting them is more important than utilizing them in the first turn next come the terminators our 10 terminators with lightning claws by the way i have uh, the icon of Heinemann on them in this case because it was my old 10 black templars roster from the how to play black templars video but nowadays i think the better choice for the relic uh, on this squad would not be the icon of Hyman that allows the sergeant to ignore AP1 and AP2, which is not bad, but with cover and armor of contempt, it's not the best choice nowadays. I will probably use Crux Obsidian, so it's our minus one damage for the sergeant that has this relic. But I digress. So we put our 10 terminators inside the ruin, so they can be shot at, but they are very hard to kill, and they are very close. They are right on the edge of our deployment zone, so that when they want to, they can move out and for example advance to stand behind the forest so up uh, and to the right of the map or just go forward and try to maybe charge something that came out of the ruin who knows i would only try to steer clear of, of the crater that is in front of them and try to move in such a way that you don't touch the crater or the forest because it will make it harder for you to move a lot harder which is probably possible because there should be like four or five inches between the crater and the forest in this case and that's why our character support comes out so put a bothicary within three inches to provide the subtract for the terminators and make it easier for him to revive them in the first turn if they get killed some of them get killed and put the hell high marshal helbrecht somewhere close by to make sure that uh, the redemptors can benefit from the uh, reroll once to hit aura once uh, they actually come out so he will probably advance to the objective in your deployment zone right in the center of your deployment zone to make sure that everyone is benefiting from his reroll once to hit bubble and of course your chaplain make sure that he's within six inches of the terminators to uh, provide the five up strike for them in the first turn and of course the fires of devotion if i remember correctly it's plus one attack for them and the last part is our category three unit it's our vanguard veterans with jump packs we will put them inside the small ruin in the left upper left corner of the table here because they are very fast and they can do a lot for us even at this position and we don't really have enough space to put them anywhere else most likely that's a great place for them because they will be able to provide some help to the redemptor dreadnoughts on the left flank while uh, while most of our army is advancing on the right flank you can either hide them behind the ruin or put them inside it or touch the walls unless if you're playing it like that to make sure that they benefit from the cover safe and like that we've tried to tick all the boxes so we made sure that our units are usable in the first turn if we want to use them and they are pretty much hidden or use the most of that's provided in our deployment zone to protect themselves from the incoming firepower or the psychic attacks in case of the redemptors and the characters so that's it guys i hope this video was helpful as i said in the beginning of the video the deployment is an art and you need some time to learn it and master it and i cannot say for myself that i've mastered it yet i am still on the journey and i hope this video has helped you on yours and as always thanks for watching and i hope to see you in the next video if you have any questions please let me know